Hi, this is Debbie Dashinger. Welcome to Dare to Dream, yet another amazing episode. And this show has been nominated for Two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award. And we were just listed, thank you, Welp Magazine, as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. Thrilled about that. It's nice when you do the work and you get recognized. I also want to recognize the people who sponsor this show because I love how they've supported us these many years. Dr. Dane here at Access Consciousness. If you would like to do energy work out in the world, and if you'd like to become a facilitator, join them, Dr. Dane here, H-E-E-R.com, as well as accessconsciousness.com. And I teach business owners, speakers, healers, entrepreneurs, and coaches the time-effective steps to write a highly engaging book. I teach private book writing clients as well as an ongoing book writing group. We meet once and twice a month on Zoom, and we happen to have two spots open. Why? Because... They accomplish their mission by coming to the Visible Visionaries class that I teach, and they're publishing their very successful book. So we have two spots open. If you'd like to join us and write your book, go to debbie-inger.com slash visible visionaries. It's D-E-B-B-I-D-A-C-H-I-N-G-E-R.com slash visible visionaries. And if you'd like a gift, how you can Find out more about how you can be interviewed on podcasts and how you can become very visible and get your message and your business out there. Go to debbie-inger.com slash gift and my gift to you. I've got templates and videos there to teach you how. So this episode today is going to contain a true story of extraterrestrial contact, as well as some information on hypnosis from somebody very unique. My guest today is Leslie Mitchell-Clark. She's a Toronto-based certified clinical hypnotherapist who specializes in a number of modalities, including working with individuals who feel that they have had experiences with extraterrestrial beings. Most of this fascinating work, as well as metaphysical therapies, such as past life and interlife regression, takes place at Leslie's Toronto Hypnosis Clinic called Light Work Hypnosis. Prior to her work in hypnotherapy, Leslie had a very busy career as an actor, a dancer, a vocalist, and for the past 20 plus years, she's been a top jazz and arts media consultant with an array of Grammy and Juno winning clients, as well as major jazz festivals and record labels. Leslie is currently the director of LMC Media with offices both in Toronto and Leslie's hometown in New York City. She's a busy arts writer, contributing regularly to a number of publications, and you can learn more at lightworkhypnosis.com. Dot com. With that, I welcome Leslie to the Dare to Dream show. I am very excited to have this conversation with you because of the work you do. Welcome. Thank you so much, Debbie, and thank you so much for having me as a guest on your wonderful program. I'm, I'm very excited to be here and to share, you know, share my journey and what I do with your wonderful audience. Okay. Yes, and I'm super excited. So let's see how we're going to weave this together, the story of Leslie and what she offers, because I know there's some yummy stories in there. Let's go to 2012. 2012, you found an organization. It's called CGI or Contact Group International. Why did you put together CGI? What was the impetus there? Well, the impetus was to create a safe space for uh, individuals who felt that they had had extraterrestrial contact of some nature uh, that could be, you know, visual in person, you know, Dr. Hynek's various stages of contact. And unfortunately, CGI didn't quite take off in the way that we we had hoped it would. And <clears throat> around that time, I became more deeply involved with MUFON, and, uh, which is the Mutual UFO Network. I'm sure the world's probably oldest organized uh, research organization mm. of 
ufology. And I was asked to become part of Kathleen Martin's experience research project. Mm. So between, between that, uh, which meant that MUFON was sending me a number of individuals for hypnotherapy between that work and um, also um, uh, we uh, my um, my writing partner Wes Roberts and I also host a show called Contact TV, which was Contact Radio for a number of years. So between those two things, uh, CGI uh, didn't quite manifest, but other better things did. So I think it was a little early. I think our timing. I think we were rushing again, as we say in music. <laughs> uh, yeah, keep it in the pocket. <laughs> yeah, we were rushing. Not we were not in the pocket at that point. We were rushing. So, uh, but. But my uh, my interest in um, in mental health care goes way back uh, to when I first uh, was at university and I, I put myself through school by being a psychiatric aide in a state mental hospital. And then later on, I became a psychiatric technician, which is a uh, really close to a, a psychiatric nurse. And um, throughout the years, you know, when my um, show business career was sputtering or whatever. I did work. I worked in a number of mental health care facilities in Los Angeles and a lot of rehabs, particularly. So I was always, always interested in, in helping people in a, in a real way. And when I got to, you know, kind of a certain point in midlife, I, I felt that the work that I was doing, particularly in publicity, was just shallow and meaningless and and what difference did it make if I blew somebody's ego up for three months you know that didn't help them as a person or solve their problems or so I was looking for something I didn't know what and um my husband god bless him he he bought me a past life regression session with a noted hypnotherapist here in toronto and not only did that session reveal to me a lot about my purpose in this life but it also um it also allowed me to know that i could do that i could do that process of hypnotherapy now i don't know whether I did it in a past life, but I, I would think maybe because it was so it was so strong. So as quickly as I could, I went back to school. I took the basic uh, hypnotist course, and then after that, I added to my repertoire and uh, got involved with metaphysical hypnosis, which today is my is my primary uh, interest. Although I do hypnotherapy for everything. So, but uh, I, I studied with the great uh, Dr. Georgina Cannon, who was very, uh, was very close with Shirley MacLaine, and I had wonderful teacher mentor. Oh, can't hear you, Debbie. I would say in my early oh. 20s, unbeknownst to me, I feel like the stage was being set for me. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting at home, switching channels, living in Silver Lake. And this movie came on about Barney and Betty Hill, right? And they were an American couple. They were abducted by extraterrestrials in New Hampshire in 1961. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. Estelle Parsons and Jane Jane Jones. Jones. Unbelievable acting. I was riveted. I My mind was blown because this was a joke to me previous. Yeah. And it changed my life. It definitely set the stage for then reading Whitley Strieber, for mm -hmm, reading mm -hmm, Shirley MacLaine mm -hmm. and starting to open me up to a world and conversation and a feeling of truth. So yeah. that changed my life. And I hear about this arc of where you had come from. How did this UFOlogy connect for you with hypnotherapy and with hypnotic regression? Well, I have always been, you know, a stargazer, if you will. I've always been fascinated with the entire subject matter. And when I was a young actor in Summerstock, when in about 1973, I had some incredibly profound experiences, which showed me clearly that we were not alone. Hmm. And so that my own personal experiences really. Can you share uh, some of that? 
I can, I can. And um, this is, you know, we're going back a little ways. By the way, I just wanted to man mention that that wonderful film, Interrupted Journey, at the time it was shot, I was a tour guide at Universal Studios and I was actually on the set for big chunks of that. And uh, it was as spine tingling when it was shot as it was in the final uh, in the final product. What a small what a, world. I know. Isn't that strange? Yes. Yeah. Well, anyway, there I was at the Black Hills Playhouse, which is out in the middle of uh, Rushmore State Park, which is where the, the Rushmore heads are of the presidents. And it's also um, uh, the territory of the Lakota people, and it's a sacred territory. And with very bizarre uh, geography, there's an area called the Needles, which is, I mean, it just looks primeval. There's, it's a fascinating part of the world. Now, when I, when I went there, uh, when I was a member of the company, I met a gal who, she was a little bit older than I, well, I mean, I, at the time I was, what, 17 or something. Maybe, maybe she was getting close to 30. She seemed really senior to me. So she was a great gal. She was a very busy singer in Las Vegas and of country music. And she worked there all the time. And I said, well, wow, you've got this busy career. You know, what, what, what are you doing here? And she said, well, I'm kind of, you know, hiding out. And then she said to me that she was a very gifted psychic, which I had no trouble believing because she had these ridiculous eyes. She was, a, she, I believe that. And she said that she had been working uh, for the United States government and uh, in uh, communication with ETs, which is, of course, telepathic and nonverbal, a lot of it. And, you know, she'd get in one of those plane wrap planes, you know, and fly off to, you know, whether it was Dreamland or Area 51, wherever it was, there was an underground base. And she worked there with a number of other psychics in communication. And it was uh, either exhausting or invasive. I don't think the communication ever stopped once you started, if you know what I mean. I think it was a 24 seven type of thing where she was being, you know, being given communications like all the time. Interesting. So she had she had enough. And um, one afternoon, um, I was hanging out by the snack bar, something I was very good at. And uh, I happened to notice that <clears throat> entering entering the theater compound was this big black. I mean. Uh, anachronistic kind of 60s looking uh, Chrysler town car. I mean, it, it was something that, that was inappropriate. I mean, you would not, it, this was the 70s. You didn't see those big black limos anymore like that, those big black cars. I don't think it had fins, but just about. So it came in and the car pulled up in front of my friend's dorm where she lived. And out of the car came these two, I'm going to call them beings because I don't believe that they were humanoid in the strictest sense of the word. They came out of the car. They were both dressed, again, anachronistically. They looked like uh, they were supposed to be thugs from, from Chicago, something out of a, they, they were wearing fedoras and they had these suits on. And I was so close. I was only, boy, maybe 20 feet away. And their skin looked very plasticky. It, it didn't look it didn't look like human flesh. It looked plastic to me, is what I remember. And there and another odd thing, is their pants were cuffed up really high, and they were wearing these these shoes that looked like orthopedic shoes. And I wonder now, were they weighted? Was that something they needed to walk around in our atmosphere? I don't know. So they went into my friend's room, and. Um, you know, this made me very nervous because I was worried about her, of course. And I was just about to run inside. I mean, I don't know what I would have done, wave my tuna sandwich at them. I mean, I don't know what my plan was, but I was going to run in. And they, at that point, they came out. They were only in there for really a very few minutes and they pulled out of the, out of the theater compound. So when I saw her, I said, what, what was that? Who are the, who are those those beings what was that all about and she said well that was more pressure uh from the government to continue working in the communication program and 
in truth, you know, she had a car, so I rode around a lot with her that summer. And every time we went into the little town, which was Custer, South Dakota, we would be followed by what I would have to call craft, because uh, they were lights that were doing things that are, that are aeronautically impossible for anything that uh, that we have developed on our own. So the presence was very much there uh, all that summer, and that completely opened my mind to the possibility that that we are not alone and you know also i'm a great i'm a great uh enthusiast of the of ancient archaeology i believe we have had many great civilizations here some of which were seeded by beings from other places uh and you know all of that ties into the work that i do and um when I when I finally became a hypnotherapist and I was working for a pretty, you know, prestigious clinic, um, about once a month, someone would call in and explain that they believed they had had experiences and they wanted they wanted regression, and um, nobody else in the clinic wanted to have anything to do with that, at all. And I said, great, send them to me. So what I eventually did is I adapted past life spiritual past life regression techniques to use with these lovely brave people what's uh, the goal of that leslie why what is, what benefits people to recover mm. these memories or suppressed memories of et's or et encounters what do they do with it well i i believe that knowledge is power Mm -hmm. And in truth, when people come to me, they generally have um, partial memories, flashes of things. Um, maybe they have a little bit of the story. So they, they, they come because on their own, they have not been able to put together their truth. And of course, many people come to me. Um, I'm sort of a last chance Texaco, if you will, because many people who come to me have already investigated what we would consider mainstream, uh, you know, psychiatric care. And there have been no answers there except people telling me that telling them that, you know, you're not insane, that you're mentally healthy. We don't know what this is. So, um, I personally also do not believe that any kind of memory block, whether it's been uh, instituted by an off world civilization or whether it's been done by our own military black ops, I don't believe any memory blocks last forever. Mm. And when people start having little flashes of stuff, mm. that's the time when stuff is percolating and when they often come to me, it, it often, <clears throat> excuse me, it often happens in midlife. It's, it's a little more unusual for a young person to come to me. Uh, but what about abduction? Does that happen typically in familial lines? I've also heard. Um, so I've also heard and I think Whitley Strieber has been on the show three times. Mm -hmm. and I think it's through mm -hmm. all of his books that it is mentioned several times. And I think somebody else that I follow, Lisa Royal Holt, mm -hmm. talks about the fact that generally when people have had trauma or a traumatic childhood, they tend to be more apt to be the ones abducted. Do you know anything about that? And, and is it something familial? Well, I, I think there are two parts to that question. The first part is, I believe that the that the experience or phenomena cuts through all lines of class, ethnicity, religious belief, um, uh, economic status. I mean, you name it. This I see a wide variety of people. Now, a lot of them are highly functional and are i mean you would be surprised attorneys i have a judge doctors you know and and so um that sort of blows apart the you know this idea that it happens to people who are somehow you know unwell or have trauma i i haven't really found that to be the case debbie i have found a, a real mixed bag. And um, in answer to your question, I am completely convinced that what most beings are interested in are individuals who have um, PSI ability, psychic ability. And I, I think it's because it's just plain easier to communicate. And 
keep in mind, you know, how many beings we're probably talking about here. I don't know if the late um, Paul Hellyer ever did your program, but he just passed. He was a lovely man. He was the Secretary of Defense for Canada and also Vice uh, um, Premier. And um, he was deep in the government activities of both the states and Canada, because we're in bed together. But, you know, it's nothing that happens that we don't know about. So um, what he said, and this was just a few years ago, that to his knowledge, uh, the Canadian government and the US government were dealing openly with at least 83 different species. Mm -hmm. So we're, we're, we're talking about a lot of different experiences and a lot of different um, beings. And in my, in my way of thinking and what I have heard and the incredibly spiritually uplifting experiences that some individuals have had, I think that most of the time we are dealing with benevolent uh, evolved species who want to help us, but at the same time, it's like raising children. You know, they have to learn. They have to learn right from wrong and become independent. And we need to clean up our own backyard. I think Big time <laughs> you know, before before we're accepted into you know. And I and I kind of believe that there is a united federation of planets, just as Gene Roddenberry envisioned. I think there is an association of benevolent beings. And uh, I and I think that um, I don't think we need any help from anybody else to be terrible to each other. Right. We're doing a great job. You know, I what mean, about really... hybrids, Leslie? Are there are there clients that you've seen ha who have somehow in this regression found out that they were hybrids or that they had their material had been used to create hybrid children and oh are they goodness. aware that is a real commonality and but it it in the hybridization program, uh, I'm going to call it the hybridization program because I believe it was primarily a specific species of greys that were involved in that. The same greys that crashed at Roswell and had a deal with President Truman and President Eisenhower. These specific greys, <coughs> zeta reticulites, mm -hmm. were, were given permission by the world governments to, or by, by the United States government at any rate, to take a specific amount of individuals and harvest their DNA material. And in exchange for which uh, the US government would receive technology. Mm -hmm. And so from that kind of situation here, we have, you know, we got integrated circuits, um, uh, fiber optics, um, uh, Velcro, <laughs> you name it. But there was, there was a lot of technology that came out after that time and that's one of the big reasons if any if any of your listeners are particularly interested in that very formative time in ufology there's a wonderful book called the day after roswell by uh, captain philip corso and he was in fact the officer that was in charge of what they called the department of foreign technology and it was foreign all right so so yes the hybridization thing has gone on and um, I have had many clients that are shown their their children mm -hmm. uh, who sometimes look so humanoid that you know it, they, they could pass you know uh, and and maybe a lot of them do now and you know, they're being I, raised by an otherworldly family who is raising them if if in fact they have families, mm -hmm. they are being raised by other these otherworldly beings. And one of the reasons that they they like to bring the parents on board, you know, later, is to show affection. Apparently, that particular group of greys, the idea of affection and holding and hugging, that's something very unusual to them. And they know it's a human thing, and they know that these hybrid children need it on on some level. But, you know, I also think that walking around among us are Pleiadians and Lyrans and, and beings that look so much like us that, that uh, you know, they're cousins. They consider themselves cousins. We come from the same uh, geophysical um, um, origins, if you will. So I think we have both things going on. But yes, I and, and you know, Debbie, it was one of the, one of the most heart-rending things that I ever saw in my work was a, a very put together grown businessman and in the regression his children came out 
and he didn't want to leave them. Mm. So he had extreme, and we get that we have extreme parental feelings from these, from mm -hmm. our own people. That's natural to us. That is, that's, that's what we're about. It, it, if, if we're, if we're sane. <laughs> You know? Yeah, there's bonding that goes on, I can imagine. And there yeah. must be something even energetic when you can recognize your own DNA. That's oh, yeah. powerful. I regularly do contact work out in Joshua Tree, out in the desert. Oh. And I go with people and we've we've got, <laughs> we're alone. We are very much alone. Uh, uh -huh. For the first time, definitely we saw craft. There is mm -hmm. no doubt. We had an incredible experience. And for people who are interested in actual contact, whether they follow Dr. Stephen Greer and his CE5 work or otherwise, are there things that we can do for us in the desert, for where anybody is? Are there things we can do specifically to invite in, to invoke our celestial brothers and sisters and have actual contact? I think we can do it anywhere. I think we can do it anywhere. I think we're talking about telepathic beings. And if we set our intention and if we create the right vibration and, you know, one of the things that the, that the Greer protocol um, has that I find so interesting, it's, it's very Vedic in its, in its approach. And so there are some, there's some wonderful uh, chanting and there are sounds that Greer has collected. And, um, but I don't know if you need accessories in that way. I think that a few people with an intention and maybe doing some meditation first, I think that they they will say, see craft at the very least if, if, if their intention is true. Hmm. How did you create the setup that you did for those who have had experience and come to see you? What is that like? Well, I think one of the most important things, Debbie, and this is true in every aspect of therapy, I think, or, or any kind of light work, or you must create an atmosphere of safety. And, and so it's very important to me, my space is, is, you know, I call it the womb room. <laughs> Because it's really, it's really comforting. I, I've all people love it. So the safest space. And uh, also, um, I, I think that, um, one of the important things to remember about uh, hypnotic regression is when people are recalling things, and this goes for past life regression as well, there is no need to re-experience trauma to have the benefit of, of having passed through it. In other words, when I'm working with someone, if as soon as I see from physical signs that they are becoming anxious about any particular situation, and this would happen more when they're recalling childhood experiences, I would say, I immediately turn that person into an observer. So they, they come out of their body in a sense, and they're looking down and they see what's happening, but they're not emotionally connected in the way of experiencing trauma. So once I think my clients understand and trust me that I'm going to take care of them, and I'm not going to let them experience trauma, but they are going to come back with knowledge and insight, then, then the work just flows. And frankly, in a way, I just kind of turn it over. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a guide. I'm a guide who knows how to talk to the subconscious mind because all hypnosis is really self-hypnosis. So that person that I'm working with wants to be in that altered alpha or theta state. And all I need to do is make them feel comfortable and guide them according to I suppose um, instinct that I have, I guide them to the places where they're going to get the information that they seek. Is it only in person or do you also these days work with people, Skype, Zoom, et cetera? I, I do work online. Now, now, I always did it a bit, but certainly in, during, the, during the COVID, um, I just said, I'm throwing caution to the wind. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to do it because people need my help and they can't get here. And, but one of the provisors that I always have in place is that when I'm working with someone in regression and it's online, they need to have a person with them there who they trust, who can reestablish the connection should you know, the Skype push 
poop out or the zoom zoom out. You know what I mean? So there has to be, that's my little proviso that there has to be someone there to reestablish the connection so that there's no risk of just leaving the person in trance, you know, hanging there. That that's my biggest fear about mm -hmm. that kind of work. Sure. I did want to say, say one little thing about Betty and Barney Hill and, and yeah. therapeutic practice and recovery of memory. Um, you know, when they, when Betty and Barney went for their, um, went for their hypnosis, um, they went to a Dr. Bernard Simon, who at the time was really known as the guy to go to for post-traumatic stress disorder. In other words, you know, what we used to call shell shock. He, he dealt with a lot of soldiers and that was his forte. So what he did with Betty and Barney, uh, today we would call it very poor uh, therapeutic process, but he had a reason. He didn't want any cross-contamination of information. So he would meet with Barney, regress Barney, and then tell Barney that he wouldn't remember anything that happened in the session and sort of push everything back. And then he'd do the same thing with Betty, but it didn't, didn't work as well. She was far more in touch with the memories than Barney was. So by doing that, uh, these poor people were re-traumatized oh, repeat, wow. repeatedly oh. because uh, so uh, we, don't, we don't take out a memory yet push it back in. I mean, that would be something that would absolutely never happen with any conscionable practitioner today. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to mention that those and particularly Barney Hill, um, you know, Kathleen Martin of MUFON is Betty's niece. So I had a chance to talk in great depth about that couple. And it's it's uh, the opinion of the family that the the way this experience was handled really killed Barney. I mean, he died way early from his stroke, way earlier than he should have. He was very deeply affected um, and there were no answers for him. It was, it was a very different situation with Betty who I think had experiences before that. I don't know if there really is, is such a thing as one isolated experience. Yeah, I think it's very difficult, you know, with the abductees who have been traumatized to wake up in a situation that is terrifying to them mm -hmm. and they feel zero control. I don't know many people like Whitley Strieber who can take something like that where he absolutely had PTSD, but today it is a joy filled experience. He's conscious about it. He's aware about it. He invites mm -hmm. it in how, mm -hmm. I mean, is that typical? Can people turn that around and find yeah. peace around it? They absolutely can. And once I tell you, I think one of the big things is when they finally realize that they're not mentally ill, that they're not having a dissociative disorder, that there actually are memories in there that they can now recall and see deeper and blah, blah, blah. So I think the relief of knowing that one is mentally healthy, that you're just a very special person. And, um, <clears throat> And I also think that when you, you can take your power back and actually, if you're a person who has regular experiencers and your experiences and you're not getting a, any sleep, you can mm. even negotiate with the beings. For mm. instance, I had a, a wonderful guy who was a college professor. And um, uh, I should also point out that many experiences that people have after midlife are etheric experiences, more like astral projection, rather than physically being taken out through the walls or the roof. It's It seems to evolve. The, the experiencer process seems to evolve to a point where it's all about the astral projection, which I think also many beings use. I don't think they're necessarily physically here all the time when we see them. I think they can holographically project and project their, their, their consciousness. And I think we, we can all do it. Obviously, we can. And uh, so that's, uh, that's what a lot of experiencers are, are going through. And um, so anyway, this one, uh, one college professor, he, he never slept because he knew that, you know, he was, they were going to come and he was going to go off and do something and it was going to be fascinating, but he'd be beat and blah, blah, blah. So I, it was actually, I just said, look, why don't we in real time right now, why don't we talk to these beings or this particular being that usually you engage with and explain that you need your sleep. I just don't think they understand. 
I don't think they sleep in the way that we do these particular beings. So we did that. And he explained, he said, I, I love what I'm doing with you guys, but, and you can come and get me on the weekend or I can go to where you are, but Monday through Friday, I have got to sleep. And it worked. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> I love the dates. He's cal- he's scheduling yeah. Monday through Friday, uh, hands off. But on the weekends, yeah. we yeah. can negotiate. And they understood. It was mm-hmm. all about, you know, we're not talking about, you know, gods here. We're talking about other beings who are on the learning curve somewhere and maybe a little bit farther down the road technologically than we are on this go around. But remember, on this earth, on this Terran earth, we were every bit as sophisticated technologically as any of the beings that come here at one time. Uh, And, you know, I think that uh, disasters, uh, the earth shifting its axis, uh, the ice age, uh, meteor showers, many of our great civilizations were destroyed and and we had to rebuild. But look how fast we did it. Um, I mean, when I was thinking about I was thinking about this today that my grandparents were both out of high school before the Wright brothers flew their plane at Kitty Hawk for like 30 feet or whatever it was. And then in the lifetime of my grandparents, they were able to see people go to the moon. But that's our that's our fake space program. Uh, what the what what NASA reveals. And uh, I uh, one of the things that I'm finding now in my work, I'm having a a preponderance of people coming to me who are participants in the um, the secret space program. I would and like to talk about that because <clears throat> I've had people, especially over the last year, say things to me. And I don't know what to do with any of them. I had one person, very, very gift, both very gifted people, actually. The first person said to me, you've been abducted before, starting at a young age. You're originally from Libra, which totally made sense to me. Oh, yeah. But, you know, I didn't know what to do with that. Is that valid? Is that not valid? I don't know. And then somebody else who said to me something about this government program and that I am somebody who has been taken for that. And again, what do you do with that? How do you know? Is it impactful? Is it important? Well, it's uh, what I would say is the, the people that have come forward to me that I've been working with have a very specific type of PTSD. They really have served. And, um, and so their memories tend to be uh, more traumatic in the sense that uh, there have been some battle conditions and things going on. Um, the, uh, I think, you know, what, what we refer to as 20 and back you would be probably in the right age category to have experienced something like that. Because what what happens theoretically um, is that um, experiencers, um, gifted children uh, who are gifted psychically or intuitively usually, or even are, are, are physically fit, they like that too. They, you know, they, they watch you growing up and, um, eventually at a certain age, you get kind of inducted into a sort of a cadet thing. And a lot of this happens, you know, with the complete cooperation of the of the American and Canadian and other military organizations. So you're in this military cadet organization, and then they start taking you out of school to go experiment with other things. And they're taking you other places and here and there. And um, uh, eventually, at the age of 17 or 18, you're brought in front of the commander or whatever and asked if you want to move ahead in the program and become a, a cadet or flyer or whatever they have in mind. And the, the individuals that sign and join that day then become part of what they call the 20 and back. So they're taken to Usually the first place they go is the is the uh, lunar base where they get their sort of basic training. But what they have signed up for is a 20 year tour of duty. And at the end of the 20 years, through the genetic magic that we actually have at our fingertips and that we've learned and taken from other beings in our own research, we are able to uh, regress those people in time back to who they were as a teenager when they come back after their tour of duty. So suddenly they're a teenager, you know, and all of that implies 
with weird feelings and big splotches of stuff missing and yes they're in their room and it's all familiar but they're they're really 20 years older and so that's um you know somebody i don't know if you've ever had him on the show but someone who would be a wonderful guest a good friend of mine would be captain randy kramer and uh he's he's been on gaia numerous times and he is um uh, has some incredibly in-depth memories and experiences, and he's very convincing. So I would, um, uh, and he could answer many more of these questions about the functioning of the secret space program. But yeah. in recent time, I have a lot of men and women, I have a lot of these people waking up and coming to me. Mm. And uh, I have a real, I have a real soft spot, a soft spot in my heart for veterans and veterans issues and all that goes with that. And the thing that angers me the most about this aspect of the secret space program is that we probably have millions, maybe at least thousands of individuals who served, who served their country, who served their world and experienced trauma and this, that and the other, and they're completely unacknowledged, mm -hmm. unacknowledged. So, you know, that's that's something that kind of it pisses me off if I can say that on the radio. <laughs> ah, absolutely. What about hypnotizing someone? If a client comes to you, have you had the experience where the contactee suddenly started channeling an extraterrestrial? Well, I've, I've yes, I have had experiences like that to be sure. In fact, one of the one of our goals when I when I work with these wonderful people is that we're looking for real time communication, which we can get in when the when the person I'm working with is inducted into trance, they can reach out to the beings that they that they engage with and freely communicate with them. And and that all we it's like all we have to do is set our intention and everything is open to us. We create our own roadblocks. And one thing I did want to mention, too, because I know you're going to ask me, I think you're going to ask me, I believe that we are in the same soul group with many, many beings. And when I have worked in the areas of past life regression and interlife regression, uh, when people have the experiences in their afterlife and they go to a council to you know, talk about their next life coming in, these councils and many of the beings walking around are not presenting as strictly human. So we are in a soul group with many beings that are that are related to us. And it's possible, for instance, you may well have had other lifetimes in the Lyran system. Mm -hmm. We I believe that most of us who are really active in these in this field now have been at least one or two times you know having a life on other planetary systems so and can we find that out through hypnosis with you can you take us through a lineage regression i can do that i can do that absolutely I, anything that you can imagine can be done because it's all about the person in trance and what they want to do anything anything is possible and uh and i tell you you know i i know that lineages are involved and you may well be carrying very special dna just from being descended from ancients you know we there's a for instance you know there's we have the issue of o negative blood which still yeah. remains a mystery the uh, i am o negative myself and i'm telling you a high proportion of experiencers are o negative i i'm not sure why but i know that o is the oldest blood type on the earth They're, they know when the different blood types came in and to not have the rhesus coating on your blood cells, which every other blood type has and every other creature on the earth, that's a little bit unusual. And we find pockets of um, uh, high, um, high percentages of O negative blood uh, among um, um, the Basque people, like 90% of them, 80, 90% of them have, have um, O negative blood. We find it a lot in, in the Celtic peoples. Mm. So my feeling is that these, that we are still carrying um, parts of ancient DNA that that is is part of our the very fabric of our nature. And when we wake up, 
you know, we're simply turning on and activating you know, what we already what we already have, what we've forgotten we have. Mm. We have global amnesia. Yeah. What do you think, based on the work you do, the people you meet, the experiences you've had by virtue of your clients, what do you think it is that the extraterrestrials want or desire from us or with us? Well, I, I think that that is a big question considering how many groups of beings interact with us. But unequivocally, I, from what I have seen and heard, the messages are the same. We are one love your fellow man, clean up your planet. Mm. Uh, I mean, they, we're, we're, we're getting the same kinds of messages all the time. And it must be very frustrating, you know, for the benevolent ETs to be, to be looking at us and saying, oh my goodness, you know, what a planet of diversity. You know, on, on one end, you've got, you know, Charles Manson or Trump. And on the other end, you've got, you know, the Dalai Lama. I mean, we have a huge, we have a huge. Um, I love that you lump them together. I'm, <laughs> I'm on board. <laughs> I just got that in there. But <laughs> it works. It works. Yeah, and but, what about uh, stories? Are there, because you've worked, I am assuming, with some very fascinating cases. Yeah. Are there a couple? that you could share with us? Because I'd really love to hear. Okay. Without, pre yeah. without protecting oh, the sure. innocent. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Well, let me tell you a little story about, um, because a lot, of, a lot of the time when I'm working with individuals, we spend quite a bit of time on the childhood experiences and processing them and, you know, and laying them to rest, sort of. So I had one gentleman that I was working with, and he had been taken the first um, the first time he was taken, he was probably three, I mean, just a baby. And this is quite common. And uh, so as a child, you know, he was used to, you know, first, um, you know, there are there are grays that I don't believe are fully biological. I think they're more like, uh, androids in a certain sense. And so the greys do a lot of transporting, even though they're not involved in the deep experimentation or the big process. And I don't think they're fully physical a lot of the time. So many beings that look like us have greys toting and doing this and, the, and that and the other. So the greys uh, came to get uh, my client one night and, and he was about 12. And this is kind of a story about um, about screen memories or artificial environments that can be created by extraterrestrials to make us feel more comfortable. So the ETs in this particular occasion, and he described them as, as very, you know, when he did see them, which was later, he described them as very, as humanoid, but very slender, very tall, hard to tell if they were male or female, but certainly not nothing very far out so so he was um he was taken out of his house floated through the wall or the window or floated through the ceiling um entered entered the craft on on a beam you know was just sort of sucked up into the craft um and the next thing he remembered is he was walking into a children's party it was like a birthday party that had been set up and all these chairs were in a circle. And he said some of the children were completely unconscious, like their heads were, you know, and some of them, some of the children he recognized because he'd seen them before in other experiences. Some were just sort of dazed. And um, while this fake activity was going on, um, a being came out of a out of a room and i think the idea was that these were really physical examinations that were going on nothing painful or hurtful but just you know measurements this that the other nothing benign but they were going to do some some physical exam so this being comes out of this room dressed in a doctor's coat with a big stethoscope and a clown mask and it was so out there and it terrified 
all the kids so much because clowns are scary. So here's where they screwed up. Clowns can be scary. Onophobia is one of the most common phobias I deal with, fear of clowns. So at that point, uh, my client being 12 years old and being kind of surly and grumpy anyway, he like turned over the table and started throwing <laughs> furnitures around. And, and the next thing that he knew, he was dropped into his bed, just dropped like, boom, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> so so he, it sounds like he set up boundaries as a kid he wasn't going to have it and that they yeah. accommodated and gave him back to his home life yes i i think it's very possible that once you are once you are aware of the idea that they can create synthetic situ situations or you know mm. screen memories as we call them that you can also see beyond them so you know i and and i think that <clears throat> the um in working with children this is kind of interesting what i hear about a lot are the brown doctors now the brown doctors are uh seemingly always involved with um any kind of physical exams of kids they're 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 frequently present they don't like to be seen because they don't want to frighten the children and so they often wear cowls and kind of you know robes but but when I have gotten kids to tell me a little bit about them, the skin is always brown. I think they might be a type of benign reptilian. I'm not sure, but I know that we, according to Randy Kramer, we have we have treaties with a number of reptilians who are regular people. You know, it's not uh, we can't judge them by the fact that they're uh, that they have that kind of DNA. So um, the brown doctors are omnipresent. And uh, I had one uh, client tell me, channel the information that they are really the geneticists, the expert geneticists of our part of the galaxy. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Um, so that was um, that was a kind of interesting little kid story. Um, what about implants? Do you have clients who um, not only claim through working with you that they have implants or memories of that, but actually have proof of it? I was very privileged to uh, work on a project with a young woman um, who's, by the way, her, her father had been in the military. Uh, we have a disproportionate amount of these children that are experiences whose parents were, were in the military. There's, there's access there somehow, you know. So she had a very palpable implant and I regressed her to the memory of it being implanted and it was also magnetic in other words you could you could hold uh, a piece of metal to to her arm it was right it was on her arm right there and um, it was removed and I believe it was removed and analyzed at the uh, University of Montreal and they did find unknown metals unknown metals is what they said. And um, uh, for more information about that, I know that was Sid Goldberg's project over at Gaia, but uh, uh, many, many experiencers have told me about receiving implants, implants. But one thing I'll say about that, I don't think that they're negative. You know, everybody, you know, they're not tracking dots. And I'll tell you why they're not tracking dots, because every human brain emits a unique signature. Every like a like a channel on a radio dial. My brain emits its own signature unique to me, as does yours. So the beings, they don't they don't need a, a metal tracking dot to find us or anything like that. If they're looking for someone they want to engage with, they can be found by their brain signature. It's so it's my belief. And from what my clients have told me, many of these implants are kind of like step up transformers. They're designed to help us stimulate psychic ability. And that's a lot of what they're about. Interesting. Stim and, and by virtue of stimulating the psychic ability, what is created that benefits the extraterrestrials and what is created? I mean, there's the obvious, what we could create by knowing, but what's the next step after that for us? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's hard to know, but I believe it's all about communication. 
I believe it's all about communication and making communication easier. And I believe that the ETs a long time ago gave up on dealing with federal governments as far as disclosure. I, I think they've just had it, you know, and, and I know that there were several times where Pleiadians came and offered, you know, the people in the White House, they said, look, we could, we, you can have free energy, we can, we, we can clean up all this fossil fuel mess. And, and the government said, well, no, because our economy will collapse. And that's more important to us than, than this future that, that we don't believe is gonna happen. So I, I think that, uh, I think disclosure is a grassroots movement. I think it's happen happening person by person. Mm -hmm. It's happening through you. It's happening through many of our colleagues. It's certainly happening through Whitley Strieber. We are really, and I, I love this term. I, I think my next book, I'm gonna call it this, we're midwives of disclosure really. Oh, cool. we are, like we're that. here to birth hmm. a, new, a new era, because if there isn't a new era, there will be no eras. You know, I mean, it's that serious. If we don't get ourselves together as far as, far as our violence to one another, yeah. as far as our, our, our inability to, to feed babies, and children and people and women, the, the disgrace of our earth, yeah. you know, if we don't get it together, you know, I we don't, don't know. have much longer. I, I completely agree. And it seems to be the one thing in common between all the extraterrestrial experts mm -hmm. that I'm talking to that yeah. they absolutely concur with what you're saying. I know that you have, Leslie, this knowledge of the abduction phenomenon going back to pre-biblical times. Mm -hmm. And you've done a lot of research in that area. So I'm kind of fascinated. Can you share some important points about that history? Well, I would just have to say that, that, you know, the contact with ETs and what we call the abduction phenomena is, is nothing new at all. Um, all you have to do is, is go back to the Bible and you know Ezekiel was taken aboard a craft even the prophet Muhammad was taken aboard a craft by the angel Gabriel and shown the world as it was as an orb now remember we're talking about these accounts of of these ancient biblical figures being taken uh, and shown space and the fact that we live on an orb you know you're talking about a time when it was the flat earth society you know no, no one had any idea about uh, the fact that we were living on an on orb and that there were other orbs they knew, saw stars but they didn't know the real deal so it's 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 something that has been um part of our um part of our genome really and um, i think if we look back to um the beginnings of civilization to the anunnaki and uh to the ancient Sumerian culture, many of the early answers start to come up there. Um, the work of Michael Tellinger, we know the Anunnaki were mining gold in Southern Africa, we know that. Uh, we know that um, uh, they were extremely humanoid and very tall. And we know that uh, from the translations of the cylinder seals of Zachariah Sitchin, we, we know that one particular um, one particular member of the royal family of the Anunnaki, Enki, and his sister and his and his son, they were very involved in the in the creation of what we now know as the as the Homo sapien sapien. We are a we were upgraded. And, you know, Enki talks about in, in the Lost Book of Enki, he talks about how he observed many different, you know, Miocene apes or early primates, and he found a group that seemed to be very compassionate. And so he began his experimentation with them. And, um, you know, many of these terms like blue bloods, this all comes from our early ancestry. I believe the Anunnaki have copper based blood, not iron. So it was a different uh, their blood would have been different. And, um, uh, you know, these, the cylinder seals are in great museums all over the world. The information is there for us to, uh, us to learn about our, our origins, or at least this aspect of our origins. And um, I think that um, one of the, one of the interesting stories about uh, the Anunnaki uh, are that uh, when they were creating homo sapiens sapiens the only thing that they couldn't they weren't able to create was um 
um, well, how should I put it? They, the Anunnaki men all looked like they were uncircumcised already. They didn't have a foreskin. And so this foreskin that men have is comes from our more animal um, ancestry. And that is really where the tradition of circumcision comes from, wanting to look more like the gods. So the foreskin has to be removed because we want to look more like our ancestors. So that's where that kind of comes from. And, uh, and then the Abrahamic tradition is all wrapped up in, in encounters with different beings. It's my feeling that the, the, the kind of angry God of the Old Testament was Enki's brother, Enlil. I don't believe it was God with a capital G. Um, you know, I, I think that um, there were manipulations of human beings going on from the dawn of our creation. Hmm. Powerful stuff. Uh, so what are you next, Dare to Dream, Leslie? This is Dare to Dream. What are your future dreams and goals? Oh, boy. I would, what I would love to do would be able to travel and, and speak more to individuals at different gatherings in different parts of the world that, you know, and that's this, this travel and this sharing of information in a person to person way is something that we, you know, we haven't been able to do and, and, and we've been denied a bit. So I guess my, my, my dream, it sounds like a simple one, but it's a profound one because uh, I believe that I would be able to reach so many people personally in, in those kinds of situations and help so many more people than I'm than I am doing now. When you mentioned earlier about the O negative, I've never heard that before. That was intriguing. That's, uh, that's often an indication. What about O positive? Is that also something, a demarcation that that makes a separation there? Or O positive is very basic? Well, O blood, positive or negative, is the oldest blood type on the earth. A and B and AB came along later. So someone, anyone who has O blood is carrying some pretty ancient DNA, whether it's positive or, or negative. Well, I love that. O positive here. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> Are you O positive? I am. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. But what about o, you? O negative. Very interesting. <laughs> And copper blood. That's like, yeah, yeah. It just makes me think that wherever they live, whatever the atmospheric or non atmospheric system, there must be something that would cause that to be healthy. That would make oh, yeah. sense. The body. Well, our blood is, is, is iron based. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know if you, you know, working in the medical field, unfortunately, I've had occasions to you know, to smell some big quantities of blood and it just smells like a piece of iron. It really does. I mean, that's that we are an iron based um, uh, being and there's no reason why if you develop on another planet that that had different metals, why you wouldn't become a copper based blood wouldn't be copper based. I don't see why that couldn't happen. Interesting. So for people who want to find out more about you, they go to lightworkhypnosis.com. And is there anything, Leslie, and I hate that it's the end, I do. Oh, no. <laughs> because this is so yummy. What would you like to tell the listeners and the watchers here at the end? I would just like to say that knowledge is power. So if you are struggling with what you feel are repressed memories, if you're if you're afraid to talk about this, if the memories are becoming more specific, um, please, please uh, reach out. And you can always get me at uh, Leslie, L-E-S-L-E-Y, at lightworkhypnosis.com. And I'm also on Facebook as both Lightwork Hypno Hypnosis and Leslie Mitchell Clark. So I would love to hear from anyone, even if you just want to talk, even if you're not sure and you just, you just want to have some questions you just have some questions about the process do not be afraid there's nothing to fear there's nothing to fear but fear itself and along those lines leslie when you make that recommendation and that kind offer what if there is somebody out there who says i don't know if i can be hypnotized or i don't know if i believe in that or i feel very self-conscious and i may get in the way 
do you have ways around that? Like do you have a hundred percent success rate and how can you work with people like that who may feel resistant to that kind of process? Well, f- frankly, about there, about 30% of people in general um, have difficulty being hypnotized. However, I must say that there's something very special about experiencers because they generally go right into the zone. And, um, you know, I, th- I think probably getting people into trance is one of my one of my strong suits. My coworkers call me the velvet hammer. <laughs> Does that I mean can, you're very persistent? I can pretty much conk anybody out without them feeling a thing. So <laughs> but but there have been there have been people who have been resistant. I tell you what what it, what can cause the most resistance is if there has been childhood trauma in in the physical life you know and you we were talking about that earlier and i have encountered that where i have not where the person was so they had suppressed so many childhood memories so many not just abductions that they were uh, they were terrified to go back and look at any of it and and that was more about the the deep familial trauma that they had experienced than about anything extraterrestrial but it was all it's all mixed up it's all in the subconscious so i have experienced that where where childhood trauma has has gotten in the way Mm. very sad yeah absolutely but i like that idea that when you bring somebody under you can have them be an observer rather than a reenactor i think that sounds yeah very healthy Um, well you you know, Debbie, first do no harm. That's the thing. That's the Hippocratic oath. First do no harm. And um, and also, as you could probably imagine, I, I have to be fairly careful on a certain level about the mental health of people that I'm working with. Um, hypnosis isn't always indicated if someone comes to me and yet is exhibiting signs of more of a dissociative disorder or something profound, in which case I have several colleagues who are psychiatrists, psychologists, psychotherapists, who are open to the phenomena of of, um, contact, and yet they are uh, legally and medically able to treat somebody who may technically have a mental health disorder. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you, Debbie. May we next meet at Cantor's. <laughs> yes, I look forward to meeting you in person when the borders open up a little bit yeah. and more will be revealed. Thank you for the great work you're doing. Thank you, I, Debbie. My pleasure. I end today's show with this quote from Werner von Braun. Our sun is one of 100 billion stars in our galaxy. Our galaxy is one of the billions of galaxies populating the universe. It would be the height of presumption to think that we are the only living things within that enormous immensity. Oh, I Subscribe love it. to this number one transformation conversation, Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. And thank you for your comments. I do read them all. I do get back to you. If you're listening to the podcast and you'd like to see what we look like, go to youtube.com slash Debbie Dashinger, and these will pop into your inbox once a week. Next week on the show, Vidika Kulhoff is returning. She is from Amsterdam. And again, she channels Arjun of the Yayel. Arjun functions as a gateway or a bridge to information without within the universe. And as you know, she is an exquisite experience and channel. Thank you for joining us today on Dare to Dream. Dare to Dream way beyond this universe and dream the dreams for this earth so we can start to turn around what's happening currently and instead have peace, love, and health for all of humanity.